Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Carolyn. Good evening. I'm John Miko, the Executive Director of the Union League Legacy Foundation, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's public affairs program. The Legacy Foundation is the nonprofit charity of the Union League of Philadelphia, and we provide civics education, scholarships. We care for the great history collections of this incredible institution, the Union League, and we use it to promote something we'll talk about tonight, the free enterprise system and the Constitution of the United States. And thank you, yes. Our programs impact tens of thousands of people each year, most of them not Union League members, most of them citizens, students. And everything that we do is made possible through voluntary contributions from members like you, or members like most of you. And I hope those of you who are not yet supporting the work of, of the Legacy Foundation will do so soon. And if you don't know how to do that, please see me afterwards, talk to Kristen Moran, go on the website, talk to the activities department, membership department, and they'll uh, let you know how easy it is to support uh, through the Legacy Foundation, uh, the free enterprise system and the constitution of the United States. So just a few housekeeping items. Um, if you would take a moment and please turn off your cell phones. Our program tonight uh, will include a presentation by our speaker, of course, and then we will be doing Q&A. And while we don't normally do this with a crowd this size, and it's wonderful that we have a crowd this size, we're going to do this with microphones. Um, so as many of you know, but I see some new faces, we have some rules on questions. Four sentences and a question mark at the end of it, okay? And our AV team can cut it off. All right, so we want success on our questions. We want to get to as many as we possibly can. Uh, so everything that we do comes through our education committee. Our education committee is uh, league members who are our leaders in what we do. And that uh, committee is chaired by Mr. Steve Target. And it's my pleasure to introduce Steve, who will introduce the program tonight. Please welcome Steve Target. Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you, John. Welcome back to uh, to Philadelphia from your trip to Rome. So it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's program, which is a joint program of the Legacy Foundation and the Business Leadership Forum, or otherwise known as BLF. The BLF is the preeminent business affinity group at the Union League. It's dedicated to sharing insights, trends, and information while providing networking, and relationships for its members. The BLF meets every Wednesday morning at 7.30 and hosts other programs and events throughout the course of the year. The next BLF event is on March 7th at 6 p.m., not 7.30 a.m., with rock drummer Sandy Gennaro. Sandy has performed with Peter Frampton, Cindy Lauper, Bo Diddley, Joan Jett, and will present how to be a rock star in business and in life. There's many benefits to being a BLF member. For example, tonight, all BLF members received a complimentary drink and a uh, book. And if you haven't received your book, I've been told that the table for BLF members is in the back corner. So for more information on the BLF, please ask the chair of the BLF, Pete Gutenkunst, or the activities department for details. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, Mr. Bob Pisani. Bob has been a CNBC reporter since 1990, as one of the most respected and well-known business journalists. He's received numerous awards, including a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Securities Traders Association of New York. In addition to covering the global stock market, he also covers initial public offerings, IPOs, exchange-traded funds, and the financial market structure. Prior to joining CNBC, Pisani authored Investing in Land, How to Be a Successful Developer, and his latest book that were lucky recipients of this evening is shut up and keep talking. Lessons on life and investing from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Bob Pisani. Thanks everybody. Uh, I wanna thank Steve for the fine introduction. Uh, John for inviting me here. Uh, this is a great honor for me to be here. This is where I live. This is my home right here in Philadelphia. Every day for the last 30 years, 33 years, every Monday, 
I have uh, kissed my wife, Suzanne, goodbye. She's sitting right here from Philadelphia, taking the train in New York. I work at the New York Stock Exchange, and I have an apartment up there. I spend most of the week there, and Thursday night or Friday night, I come back home to Philadelphia, and I date my wife. And, and she's not a cheap date, let me tell you, uh, <laughs> which is why I'm still working. And we live on Pine Street, and we've lived on Pine Street for 40 years. So I'm quite serious. This is my neighborhood. I live here on these streets, and this is a particular honor for me to be in my hometown uh, tonight. I'm not in love with standing. Uh, I move around on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, so you're going to see me move around a lot. Uh, shut up and keep talking. People ask me, "What? how did you come up with a strange name? And you have a publisher, and the publisher took the book, and he said, we had a meeting and they said, we're going to take this book because you're very unusual. You have a very unique perspective on things. You have been on the floor since 1996 and very few people ever stay anywhere in one job. And it's unusual. And you've seen a lot of financial changes and a lot of crazy things happen. You've seen 10,000 bell ringings on the floor. Literally, we added it up. Actually, it was quite remarkable. You've met all these celebrities and everybody else. And so you have a unique perspective. We don't want you to write a memoir, but we want you to tell you about financial history from your perspective, from the people you met. We want to hear stories. We want to hear celebrity stories, CEO stories, interweave your memoirs, your personal memory with financial history. And that's why we're taking the book. Now, we need a title. What do you want to call this book? I said, well, I want to call it Lessons on Life and Investing from the Floor of the New York Stock Exchange, because that's the point of this. I felt the need to summarize what I think I've known being on the floor for so long. If you're really curious about this and you've been around long enough in any single subject, you have the need to kind of spill your guts and say, this is what I think I know. And first off, do I know anything at all? What actually do you know? Or are you just some kind of bubble-headed TV reporter like the print guys think you might be. It's always a little bit of suspicion with the print guys, you know? So I said, I'd like to call it Lessons on Life and Investing from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. I said, well, that's a subtitle. That's not a title. We need a title. Now, what do you do when you're waiting to go on the air, right? You're, you're on the floor and what happens? And I said, well, you have an earpiece you're connected to it. Uh, a monitor and you have an electronic microphone and you have, what's called, you have what's called an IFB, an interruptible fallback. It's a piece that goes into your ear and it connects to the control room and the producer talks to you. And it's okay, what does the producer tell you? I said, well, you can say anything you want. How you doing? How's things? But normally it's some variation on the phrase rap, which means shut up or the word stretch, which means keep talking. And I said, it's usually some variation on shut up and keep talking. And he said, that's it. That's the title. Shut up and keep talking. So that's how the name came about. Now, I'm going to ask you a very simple question. Those of you who've been around for a, a long time. I call myself a very lucky man because it is very unusual to have been there for a long time, 33 years, uh, one place at CNBC. I'm one of the founding members of CNBC quite a long, lustrous history. Uh, it is part of NBC, which is now owned by Comcast. At that time, it was owned by General Electric. It was quite an organization. Uh, it is a big, big company, Comcast. General Electric was an even bigger company. At one point, it was the biggest company uh, in the world. Uh, and one of the things I'm very proud of is that it makes money. Uh, we're capitalists, uh, and CNBC makes money. It is a successful organization, and I'm part of the success of that. It makes me very proud. It's a stable company with stable leadership for a long time. People ask me, why the hell have you stayed there for 33 years? Why are you on the floor for 26 years? Is there something wrong with you? Are you like, do you just like drinking with the traders every night? What is it that you are so enamored with being down there? And I'm going to tell you what it is. I'll tell you, I'll ask you a simple question. What would you give to meet all of your heroes? Every single person you ever wanted to meet in your life, every rock star, every CEO, every king, every queen, everything I have, because they all come and ring the opening and closing bell. It's been a prestigious thing to do for decades and decades. In fact, there's been a bell ringing at the New York Stock Exchange since the 1860s, literally since the 1860s. That's how far back this whole process goes. So what would you give to meet all your heroes? What would you give to 
spend 15 minutes with Muhammad Ali. This is December 1999. This is the greatest month of my life. I can't even, you, you can't even imagine how much fun it was in December. It was like the end of the world down there. It was, it was the tail end of the great internet boom. It was the tail end of a great economic boom. Uh, Netscape had gone public in August 1995, and it was a shiny new object. We didn't know it, but it was going to change the world, that IPO. And there was a series of the NYC orchestrated a series of people coming down the floor for the millennial, literally the end of the century. So I stood there and I'm a little excited to meet Muhammad Ali. Even then, even advanced age in 1999, he came in and I walked up and shook his hand. This is the second I did it. And I'm thinking, God, he's going to, he's an old man now. And I walked up and Muhammad Ali's six, three, I'm six feet. So I'm not small. But when I looked at him, right at him, and shook his hand, his shoulders were broad. He shook my hand. His hand went around my hand. And I'm, I looked down. I said, shit, wow. And I looked at him just standing right up against him, like really man to man. I said, I wouldn't want to be Sonny Liston in 65 going against this guy. Even then, in 1999, he was intimidating and impressive to be around. I'll never forget that. What would you give to spend 15 minutes with Walter Cronkite? My God, nobody remembers Walter Cronkite anymore. It's such a shame. But when I grew up in the 60s, he was the voice of America. When, when Lyndon Johnson said, if I've lost Walter Cronkite, who came out against the Vietnam War, then I've lost. I've lost Vietnam and I've lost America. And he did. That was the end. When Cronkite came out against the Vietnam War, it was over for Johnson. And he came on the floor in 1990, three days after Muhammad Ali. And he said, you know, I don't understand something. When I, back in the 50s and 60s, we didn't cover the stock market like this. You guys are like big stars now. What, what happened? Well, explain how this, how this occurred. And I'm talking to Walter Cronkite. This is the picture where I'm talking to him. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, Walter Cronkite's interviewing me. This is the greatest thing ever. This is what I'm talking about. Like, what would you give to meet all the people you ever wanted to meet? And they're talking to you like you're practically an equal, but you feel amazed and somewhat astonished and intimidated. So the, the, the famous guys in the middle, this is Warren Buffett. It's about the same time. Uh, but the real star is the guy on the right. That's Jimmy McGuire. That is Wal Warren Buffett's specialist. He was the man in charge of Berkshire Hathaway on the floor. He's the guy who determined open and closing prices on the floor of the stock exchange. And this was a time where Warren Buffett did not talk to the press. He did not give interviews. It was really rare to see him. And Jimmy McGuire was the guy who helped me out tremendously. There were 4,000 people on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange in 1997 in the summer when I got there. They did 80% of the volume, 4,000 people on the floor. And he went around to everyone and said, you can talk to Bob, you can trust him. And there were 4,000 people on the floor that weren't sure they could trust me. And he made it possible. And on this day, Warren, he called me over and said, I want you to meet Warren. And Warren, you see the, 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 the wallet there? This was a joke that Warren always did. He said, I know, you want my money, right? And he would always hand the wallet. That's the joke there, holding the wallet. But Warren, but Jimmy insisted, I stand next to Warren and watch him open the stock because this was done manually. You were opening these stocks manually. And Berkshire was the biggest of all. And this was the most important stock down there. It was the highest price stock. And Warren Buffett would brook no crap from anybody. If he didn't like the prices, he, he would let you know. And they were very close friends. Once a year, he went out to Omaha, spent the weekend in Warren's house with him in his house with him talking about what the markets were doing. What would you give to spend 15 minutes standing next to Warren, watching him open the stock and whispering in your ear about Pepsi, which is what a big thing that he owned. Aretha Franklin. Now, people ask me all the time, I'd like to really impress somebody. How do I impress somebody? How can I get someone to remember my name, to pay attention to me, to impress them on their mind who I am? And the way you do this, the way it's worked for me, Find what the person really cares about, not what they're there for. It's usually not the same thing. There's something else they really care about. This is the winter of 2008. You remember that? Worst year ever for stock market. 
people were crying about last year. The S&P was down 19%. The S&P was down 35% by winter of two, by December 2008. She came onto the floor to promote her, her Christmas album. Now, I knew that even though she's wonderful, even though she's a great gospel singer, this was not a big thing for her. I had another idea. There was a biopic out called Ray at the time, a biopic of Ray Charles. It was going to win an Academy Award. And it was about Ray Charles and how Ray Charles invented soul. And he showed in the, it was a biopic showing how he invented soul music. Soul music is a cross between gospel and popular music. And it was an educational movie that was really set up as entertainment, as a biopic. And she was a part of all that, but she wasn't in it. And I said to her, you know, Ms. Franklin, there's this great movie out about Ray, a man who was a friend of yours. And it was about the invention of soul music. And you were part of that. How do you feel about your legacy? And is there an interest that you have in a movie? And her face just changed. She's, she just suddenly looked up and said, yes, we're working on a biopic now. I have hired a team. I love that movie very, very much. And she went on and the interview ended. We did it on air. And then afterwards, she turned to me and said, so listen, I've got a whole team and I'm, we're looking at a draft. And I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just trying to figure it out. But I, yes, I'm going to do this movie. I don't know. Unfortunately, she passed away before it came out. The movie did come out. It took 14 years for them to get the movie out. That took a very, very long time. But there's the point. Find what they're interested in. The manager, her manager, came up to me afterward and said, I don't know what you said to her, but she doesn't go on like that. You, Whatever you said, it got her going. Here's another example. Robert Downey Jr. Now, this is 2000, this is 10 years ago, 2012 or 2013, Iron Man 3 had come out, was coming out. He was doing the promo. That's what this was for. And what happened with these movies is these properties became enormous. Iron Man 2 had generated not 50 million, not 100 million, a billion, one and a half billion literally one and a half billion. No one had ever seen numbers like this. So what happened was the property became bigger than the stars, much, much bigger than the stars. And this hadn't happened before. Usually all we have to protect the stars privacy, you know, we don't want to talk too much, blah, 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 but no, no, no. It became all about protecting the property. So what happens when you protect the property is the people around it, you don't want them to say anything. So the PR people for him, day before, he's going to ring the bell, the promo Iron Man, came up to me and said, uh, Robert's coming tomorrow. They always say Robert, like I'm supposed to know who Robert is. I said, yeah, I know. Really excited. They said, he's not talking to you. I said, well, you know, I'm standing here. He's going to ring the bell. There's the podium. He'll come down. And, you know, maybe he'll come over and say hello. He's not talking to you. I said, well, you know, I'm just here. He said, we know who you are. He's not. He's not talking to you. He's not talking to anybody. He's going to ring the bell. He's going to walk down. He's going to wave like this to everybody. You're going to stand there and you're not going to do anything. So it's like you're dealing with some kind of muscle here. And I'm looking at them. Well, OK, sure. Now, this pisses me off. So I go home. And I collected comic books in the 1960s. I still have sort of a collection. I actually have the first Iron Man. That's what that is right there. That's Tales of Suspense 39. I hope you're writing that down. That's in the quiz. I also had Avengers 1, first uh, big uh, Avengers comic book. This is 1963. Write that down. That's in the quiz too. And so how do you get someone interested in you? Again, this goes back to that question. So Robert rings the bell. He comes down the stairs. And these, guys, these PR people had assigned two bodyguards on either side of me, because I'm standing there like this. I got a camera. There's a remote camera. I got a cameraman. He's standing there, and I'm standing there, and Robert's coming down the stairs, and there's these two bodyguards in front of me, so I can't go like literally right in front of him and say, hi, Robert. They won't let me. I have the comic book. So I hold the comic book over the bodyguard. As he's walking by, I say, Robert, you know what this is? Now, you're bam gambling that he knows exactly what the property is because he's vested in this whole thing, too. So he's walking by and he's he said, is that the first Iron Man? I said, absolutely. Robert, come on over here and say hello to CNBC. And there we are. OK, so. Find out what people are interested in, by the way, why was PR being such nasty people? Because they didn't want the stars saying anything 
that they thought would be silly, stupid, quotable, or anything because the properties were too valuable. It used to be in the old days, you'd be able to go up and say, I sat with Sean Connery and all these stars back in the 90s. Nobody cared. Now, the property was too big for anyone to take any risk. That's why they didn't want to have anybody around you. So there's, there's a lot of stuff like this going on in the book. Barry Manilow. Well, to say I'm not a Barry Manilow fan would be a small uh, understatement. I'm a Led Zeppelin guy. <laughs> so I'm very far from Barry Manilow. <laughs> People who know me would be laughing now. <laughs> so, but one day... He comes on the floor and it's the same thing. He's promoting an album that I know he doesn't particularly care about. And you have one of these magical moments on the floor where he, he did a quick interview with us. I didn't do the interview, but he just talked about this new album he had out. And he comes off and I'm just standing there and he's standing there too. And he's right next to me. So all of a sudden you're alone with Barry Mantle. Okay. What do you say to Barry Mantle? Okay. So, I, you know, really don't like your music. Really don't. Can't stand it. Didn't buy any of it. You know, how do you even, you know, get through life? So I said, I said, uh, you know, I got a question again, what do people care about? It's not about the album. They don't. So I said, you know, I've always wondered this. Did you write the State Farm jingle? You know, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. And he looked at me, smiled and said, I wrote that. I wrote, and he said, I said, why? He said, you know, I was a jingle writer. That's what I did before I became a songwriter. I was a jingle writer and I wrote that for $500. I sold it to them and I never regretted it. And who the hell knew it was going to be so famous? He said, I wrote a whole bunch of famous commercials. He wrote the band aid commercial band. Um, I'm band aid stuck on you. Yeah. Somebody's singing it. Right. And he starts singing these commercials and I'm just me and Barry Manilow on the floor. I'm thinking, this is kind of cool. Barry Manilow. I wonder if he's going to break into a whole lot of love here, you know? And he starts talking things. I'm thinking, oh, this is kind of entertaining. And then I said, I, there's something I just don't understand. You, you just sold out Nassau Coliseum, 15,000 at Nassau Coliseum. It's like the Wells Fargo Center. And you, you, know, you haven't had a hit in a long time, a big hit. And how do you do that? And he said, you know, it's funny. The, when I started out, uh, and after I became a jingle writer, I started writing songs and I had a whole bunch of hits. I mean, I was really big. And then the, sort of this middle part of the career comes where all of a sudden you don't have a lot of hits anymore. But I didn't go away. I kept producing albums. I kept doing things. And I had albums that came out that did very well, but they weren't necessarily, I didn't necessarily have big singles on them that you're talking about. And I said, I just really liked it. And I got over the not having big hits and made peace with that. And I really liked the music I was making. And I was happy. And I just kept at it. I just kept doing it. And then suddenly I had been doing it so long that somebody started writing stories about me saying I'm a legend. Suddenly I'm a legend. And now I'm I, I, and I thought this guy is actually in his own way, very profound. He really was. He what he was saying was in the middle part, you have a certain amount of fame. This is a career metaphor. You have a certain amount of fame in the beginning. So you get promoted, you do okay. And then you hit the middle part of your career. We actually have problems because you kind of get stuck. And a lot of people leave and quit. They do something else. But people who really like what they're doing, they stick with it. And this hit a chord because this is what I did. I had the same mid-career crisis after 2000 and 9-11 happened and the, and the stock market fell apart. I had the same, oh, it's over. I should leave. And I decided not to because I really liked what I was doing. I liked being a, a TV reporter and I stuck with it. And you stay at the other end and suddenly, you know, I'm senior markets correspondent now. And, you, and so it struck me on a personal level. And who knew, you know, Barry Manilow was actually kind of a sage about the whole thing. And he had a very wise way of, of looking at his career. So I'm still not a big Barry Manilow fan of his music, but I have a lot of respect for the man. So much respect, I actually went and read a biography of him, most of which contained pieces saying people laugh at him like I was laughing before, but actually the guy has some very interesting things to say about fame and the pursuit of what your passions are. So there's a, a, you know, a casual encounter. Who thinks anything about that? And it actually turned out to be a very interesting meeting for me. Then you have Motley Crue. Oh boy. Uh, so I'm on, I'm on the air one day 
I'm about to go on the air live and Motley Crue is ringing the bell. <laughs> and uh, so they come, they come down the stairs and they are coming towards me. And it, it, look at this. It's like meeting the Adams family. For crying. I mean, you think like cousin it's going to be here and lurch is going to come out of the corner and say, hello. it's like meeting the Adams family. And I'm saying to the producer, I got the IFP in my ear. I said, you're not going to believe this, but, uh, Tommy Lee is coming at me and he's looking at me and he looks like he wants to come over and say something. Let's put him on the air. And the producer goes, Bob, we can't do that. I said, well, why not? Come on, Bob. This is like Motley Crue. This, we're going to be live on TV. Who, who knows what, what these guys are going to do? They're going to beat the crap out of you in front of you know everybody. I said, oh, it's not going to be that. Said, Bob, no. I said, come on. Tommy, come on over here. No, no, Bob, we're not taking this picture. We're not, but Tommy, come on over. So we take this picture and the, the, the guys refused to take the shot. Um, and they, they were reasonably uh, okay. I'll, I'll tell you a separate story sometime later at the bar when there's only four of you, what happened afterwards immediately. Can't do that here. Um, I could do this all next 30 minutes with nothing but stories like this. I want to make some comments about the markets because I think the point of this book was other than to tell some silly celebrity stories uh, was to summarize what I think is going on and what I think I know about the markets and about uh, investing. There were three major things that I saw in the last 30 years that affected me tremendously. The first was electronic trading. When I got there, they were trading in eights, eights of a dollar on the floor, mostly open outcry. Within, that was 1996. By 2000, they were trading in pennies. The entire brokerage industry essentially collapsed around this. Uh, that's decimalization. The other major thing was the growth of passive investing, meaning indexing, and the growth of exchange traded funds or ETFs, which are largely vehicles around passive investing. This completely changed the dynamics of people's ability to invest in low cost uh, index funds. Low cost was the absolute key. And the final was the development of behavioral finance. What is that? Behavioral finance purports to study how people really behave, not how they're supposed to behave. You're supposed to buy low and sell high, right? Isn't that the fundamental thing, right? Rational actors, buy low and sell high. It turns out nobody does this. People buy high and sell low. Why? Behavioral economics purports to study what's going on there. So let me quickly start here and I'm gonna run through several precepts in the next 20 minutes that I think are a, a fundamental ground rock for what anybody should understand about the markets. And I'll start with behavioral economics. The man had a very big influence on me, Robert Schiller won the 2013 Nobel Prize. By the way, there's not officially a Nobel Prize. Somebody always raises their hand. It's a memorial prize, okay? So we all know that uh, for economics. And what he discovered, this is 40 years ago, he's discovered that the stock market is a lot more volatile than you would expect from rational actors. In other words, stuff moves around in a much wider trading band than you would expect if everybody actually bought stocks and sold stocks based on the fundamentals of what the companies were doing. Uh, and what he essentially said was that there seems to be a irrational component to investing overlaying the fundamentals of the stock market, meaning that you buy stocks for dividends and a future stream of earnings. That's the purpose of owning stocks. And you'd think you could price the market on that basis. And he tried and it turned out, eh, it is a, there's a, an irrational component here. And these biases affect the ability to make better choices, these behavioral biases that are out there. If there's anything that has obsessed me in the last 30 years, it is this question. Why is everybody so bad at figuring out the future? Hasn't anyone noticed this? And it's not just weather forecasters, by the way. Everybody is terrible at figuring out the future. We make fun of amateur stock pickers. We call them dumb money, which I find offensive, frankly, for your average stock picker. But we know they're bad at picking stocks. But we now know professional stock pickers, they're bad at picking stocks, too. Professional economists are bad at figuring out the economy. And here's what really pisses me off. The Federal Reserve, with the finest economists in the world, have a terrible track record of predicting the U.S. economy one year out. Not 10 years. Nobody knows 10 years of anything. 
one year out, you think the finest economists in the world would know what exactly is going on. They don't. And I noticed this 20 years ago. And you keep asking around, if, if this doesn't bother you, considering we have people on every day predicting every kind of thing, including the weather, and it doesn't seem to work very well, if that doesn't bother you, you're not paying attention. So it turns out there's a several reasons why this happens, and the book has several chapters devoted to what goes on here. There's two fundamental problems. The first is that predictions are riddled with biases that limit the quality of the predictions. What does that mean? There's a couple different kinds of biases. There are emotional biases. These are biases that affect the way we feel. So you can have this thing called loss aversion, where the 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 fear of a loss is much greater than the expectation of a gain. This accounts for why people hold on to losing stocks for very, very long periods of time, and they sell their winners too early. There's overconfidence. People think, oh, I was right on Tesla. I'm going to be right on IBM. That's a bias. That affects your ability to understand what's going on. Then there's cognitive biases. These affect the way you think. They're, they're errors of thinking. You think you're rational, and you're not rational. So there's a confirmation bias that people have. I don't want to listen to anyone that doesn't have my opinion. And the rest of you go to hell. I don't care. Well, that's a bias because the other guy may be right, but you don't want to hear it. Confirmation bias. There's the gambler's fallacy. We all know that. Okay. You go to, go to Atlantic City. You go to, the, you go to the roulette wheel. Got a red and a green. Okay. What's the odds red's going to turn up? It's 50%. Forget the zero, zero. It's 50%, right? Okay, red turns up. What's the odds on the next roll red's going to turn up? It's 50%. It's red. Two times in a row, it's red. Well, green's going to turn, right? Of course. Next, what's the odds? Black, sorry. What's the odds? It's going to come up again. 50%. Boom. Nobody believes this. You explain this to everybody on any one roll. It's 50%. Nobody believes. Well, it just came red three times in a row. It's got to be something else. No, it doesn't. It's 50%. It doesn't. No, that's not true. Okay. Can't be. Okay. Fine. You keep betting on that. So there's another problem that's even more fundamental, and it goes to the unknowability of the future. So we don't have complete information. So think about this. You're an analyst, you're a stock analyst, you cover Caterpillar, pick up a co company, doesn't matter. And you're supposed to figure out what the earnings of Caterpillar are, and the price of Caterpillar is going to be one year from now. That's your job. You're paid to do that. You think like, gee, how hard could that be? It turns out to be almost impossible because there are events occurring that are unpredictable and can affect the outcomes. Think about this on a macro level, economy. You could have inflation hit you, interest rates, Wars on a company level, you could have cyber attacks, new competitors, the, the CEO could fall ill. And this does happen, by the way. And you could have mergers, you could have other things happen. Uh, then you have forget, black swan events. Let me ask you this. Four years ago, I'm going to tell you, here's a story. The world's going to be affected by a global pandemic. It's going to kill a million people in the United States. And you say, I know. I saw that movie. It was 1973, right? Didn't Robert Crichton write that? Right. Good. Okay. No, it's really going to happen. No. And we don't even know how many millions of people are going to die globally. And the entire economy of the world is going to be shut down effectively for 18 months. The entire economy, the streets will be empty. Right. We saw that movie too, right? When was that? 85? No. And no one would believe it because it's on nobody's scenario list. They're what we call black swans. Here's another one. There's going to be a conventional ground war in Europe. Russians going to invade with tanks into Ukraine. Well, that's a stupid thing. Nobody believes that because you can't have a conventional ground war because there's no reason for anyone to attack anybody like that. And at any rate, you know, there's sufficient protection in, uh, in, in NATO and you're not going to have there's no ground war that's ever going to happen. Two, they both happen. Well, how? Out of nowhere, black swan events occurred. So this goes to the unknowability of the future. You put this together. And what happens is, if you're a guy like me sitting there talking about the stock market every day, you get very humble. If, if you don't look at this and kind of understand what you control and what you don't control, and you see what you can't control, 
you get humble and you stop sounding too pompous about a lot of things. You allow for a lot of uncertainty here. So here's a couple key takeaways. What happened because of behavioral economics, when they started to really publish a lot of stuff about this 20 years ago, is that it gave a big boost to indexing and passive investing. The people who just want to buy the S&P 500 and not try to beat the market. Because everybody said, look, if, if we don't, if the future is so unknowable, number one, and we have all of these biases, then why? Why try to outperform everything? Why don't we just stay with the market? So that gave a huge boost to indexing and passive investing. And psychology, this irrational thing, there's a thing called efficient market hypothesis, where the market's always essentially price is right at that moment. It's not that it's necessarily the market's always right. It's just that the market has the most information that anybody has is right there in front of you and the market prices that in there. And you have to give up the idea that everything is totally rational. There is a slight irrational component to investing. It helps explain bubbles, for example. Uh, and finally, you it is possible to improve people's prognostication. There's an entire project devoted to this called the Good Judgment Project. I'd encourage you to look at this about how to make people better forecasters. I, I don't have time to explain it to you, but it's in the book. Uh, and it's there's some wonderful books that have been written about how to improve forecasting. So you can do it, but don't expect too much because frankly, people don't think very well. Uh, if I had a way of teaching critical thinking in high school, that and economics 101 would be the most important thing. How to think rationally and critically is, is dramatically lacking frankly, uh, in a lot of people. And you see it every day. You see the mistakes that people make. So here's some basic, I, I talk to high school kids all the time. They say, if you have some advice to give us about investing in general, what would you say? Well, um, you know, Einstein said that compounding interest is the eighth wonder of the world. And it is the most, if you had nothing else to explain to a high school kid, I'd say, let me explain what 2% 2 dividend on the S&P is like. 2% a year sounds like nothing, but 2% compounded over 30 years is big money because it's making money, money making money on money. That's what compounding interest is. And if you had anything to explain to a high school kid, it's understanding what compounding interest and what it does. You keep costs low by owning index fund. That's Jack Bogles, the man who had the most influence on me, founder of Vanguard. There, occasionally you will find people who outperform that really do pick stocks, but they're rare and they usually destroy their outperformance because they charge too much. So even Jack Bogle, the founder of Vanguard, was involved in active management, even though he believed in indexing. And he said, it's going to be cheap. And Vanguard today is the monster company that it is because of that initial founding. And finally, don't try to time the markets. Uh, I know we all know that a large number of people want to bet on the horses, want to bet on the stock market, and want to beat everybody and beat the market. We all know this, but the weight of evidence is it doesn't work. And I can show you some very simple things about this. Uh, it, it, trying to explain, remember, market time, you have to be right going in and right going out. And there are errors both sides that you make. So here's a simple explanation of what market timing will do. Put $1,000 in the S&P 500 over 50 years and reinvest the dividend, okay? You have $138,000 after 50 years. This is uh, 1970 to 2020. Miss the five best days. Only, only, excuse me, what, miss the best performing day. One, the one best performing day in 50 years. So you have $138,000. Miss one day, the one best day, you have $124,000. Miss the five best days, just five out of 50 years, you have 90,000. Instead of 138,000, you have 90,000. Miss the 25 best days, you have 32,000 instead of $138,000. Now, that's what happens in market timing. What five days are those best days? Who knows? Nobody knows this. Oh, and by the way, smart ass has always raised their hand. Mr. Pisani, isn't it true that it's on the opposite side that if you're not there in the five worst days, you do? But yes, yes, I can invert this and show you what happens when you're not there in the five worst days. It's the same thing. The point is nobody knows when these days are. The future like this is unknowable. And when you realize that, this was the argument that is made. Active managers still underperforming. 
These are the smartest people. After five years, 84% of large cap managers underperform their bogey, 84%, 90% underperform after 10 years. So people laugh, they say, ha, huh, they're stupid. They're not stupid, it's actually the opposite. They're too smart. What happens today is there is very, because of the dissemination of information, there is very little informational advantage that anybody has anymore. And that's the real problem, that's what occurs. Uh, for most of these people. So they're not stupid. These are the best, smartest people I know. Believe me, Wall Street is not stupid. Believe me, these people know it's scary how smart these people are, but they're competing against everyone. Everyone in the room's a PhD. Everyone in this room is just as smart as everybody else. Good luck. Your performance metric on outperformance, it's going to be very, very small. The S&P studies this every single year for decades. They found the persistence of fund performance, that means outperformance, was worse than would be expected from luck. Worse than would be expected from luck. High school students, again, I love high school students. Does, does the stock market go up all the time? Yeah, well, most of the time it does. Look, since 1928, the S&P 500, year over year, is up three out of four years. Just keeps going up. 72%, 28% down. That's pretty good. Doesn't go up every year. Doesn't say that. But that's pretty amazing. Here's something even more amazing. This is why you get wealthy in the stock market. It goes up more than it goes down. And it goes up on a percentage basis much more than it goes down on a percentage basis. So here's what you want to focus on right there, these two. So 36% of the time, this is since the 1920s. The S&P is up 20% or more. This is year over year. And by the way, it includes the dividend. People who look at stock charts that don't include the dividend, that's a mistake. You get a dividend, okay? So the S&P is up 8% on a price basis and you get another, some years, two, 3%. It's actually up 11%. And you've got to include that. And these includes the dividends, oh, excuse me. Um, and look here, 21%. 10 to 20% of the time. Add these two together, 57% of the time, let me close you over here, 57% of the time, the S&P 500 is up 10% or more. Now, wait a minute, look down here. Only 10, 12% of the time is the S&P down 10% or more. Okay, you get this? 57% of the time, the S&P is up 10% or more. 12%, it's down 10% or more. So you're up three out of four years and it's up a lot more than it usually is down. That's why people get wealthy in the stock market in the long term. Big market declines, everyone was weeping about last year. It's extremely rare what happened last year. Peak to trough decline was about 25%. Peak to trough means not year over year, means from the highest point, it was, which was January 4th, to the very bottom of the market, which was middle October, the stock market, the S&P was down 25%. That is extraordinarily rare. In fact, you see here, down more than 20%, that's only peak to trough eight times since 1926. Eight times, that's pretty rare. And here's what you care about on the bottom here, Two thirds of the time you're made whole within a year of these circumstances. So you see, everybody's freaked out. Oh my God, is it gonna be down again? Well, it could be, but it is extraordinarily rare to be down two times in a row. It, it, I, I don't wanna go into whole history of markets for you, but it doesn't happen very often. Now, and I'm, I'm gonna move down quickly and descend here and then take some questions. The high school kid I was in one day, I go through this, and this kid raises his hand. Mr. Pisani, why does the stock market go up? Why doesn't it go down? Why doesn't it go sideways? Why does it go up like you say? You know what? That's the smartest question. Any, why, why does this whole thing work? Why do, why do people make money like this? Now, there's food fights about this. I'm not going to go deep. I'm going to tell you what seems to me obvious about the way our system is set up here. And it has to do with what I call the capitalist spectrum. So in the United States, we have market capitalism. What does that mean? The, mostly the means of production is in private hands and corporations. The classic is a pizza shop. The guy owns a pizza shop. He's got a certain amount of capital. If he makes enough money, he'll buy a new pizza oven. 
he'll fire people, hire people, depends on how businesses, he makes the decision. The government doesn't tell the guy what to do. Same with the corporations. These, this method where capital is in the hands of private individual is a ruthlessly efficient allocator of capital. People get fired, they buy more stuff if they think they can make money. Uh, they get less stuff if they think they can't make money. They pay a dividend if they can't figure out whether they want to buy another plant. That's individuals making decisions are the best allocators of capital. And this is reflected in the stock market because the stock market is a mechanism for returning profits to shareholders. That's what it's there for. If you ever have any doubts, I would encourage you to look at the very first stock that ever floated. In 1602, the Dutch East India Company, the Amsterdam Stock Exchange, was created to trade this stock. And in the prospectus, they said, the very first stock, the modern stock, they said, when you buy our stock, we are going to take the spices from the ships that come in. They own the spice trade in Indonesia and the Moluccas. They brought the ships in. We are going to sell the spices on the market in Amsterdam, and we are going to distribute the profits to our shareholders. They hold your hand and tell you that's what we're doing. We're just we are a mechanism for distributing profits from the spice trade. And that's what capitalism is, as it's practiced in the United States. Now, there's other spectrums of capitalism in Europe, for example, France. France is a capitalist country. But there's more state control of certain enterprises that are there than they are here. Now, it's not that that's evil or anything like that. But if you watch and pay attention, they are less efficient allocators of capital when there is government involved in general. The third spectrum is what I call state capitalism in China. And we have a real problem here because we already have what are called SOEs. Uh, excuse me, state-owned enterprises here, there, SOEs. These are like big banks in China. They are effectively controlled by the government. They do have a supposedly independent board, but they're not. And more alarming, what's happening in China now is the government is going into so-called private companies like Alibaba, and they are seeking what they call golden shares. Golden shares is a front for control of the company through special shares that have special voting rights. That, I don't know what you call this, uh, as it's, this is evolving in China, that ain't capitalism. Uh, that is, a, if that's not a definition of socialism, I don't, know, I don't know what is. So I don't wanna get too heavily into this, but there's a reason, this is what I explained to the high school kids, the way we practice uh, capitalism in the United States, the most efficient allocator of capital. And let's not get too damn intellectual about using fancy words like efficient allocators of capital. This is the best system ever devised for lifting people out of poverty. That's what the story is. That's what matters. That's why we're capitalists. That's why I'm here. That's why I believe in the stock market. And that's why I believe in the economic system as it's practiced in the United States. Okay, enough for the soapbox on that one here. Uh, the same high school kid said, all right, and I'm winding down here. Well, what's the most important thing to remember about investing? Return, th these are the four things. Bogle used to scream at me, you're getting too far away from things. Emphasize, return. How much do you think you can make? How much risk can you afford without damaging your psyche? He loved that phrase without damaging your psyche. Well, keep the costs as low as possible. Don't pay out a lot of money. It eats into your profits. And consider the length of your investment horizon. With a longer term, you can take more risk. And risk is the key here. People tell me now, well, Bob, I'm 65 and I can't have 75% of my, of my savings and of my wealth in stocks. I can't sleep at night. It's too risky. And I think people look at this in the wrong way. So here's a simple example of the, the, a simple thing here. So you've got personal savings of, let's say, $250,000. Let's say you got a house and it's paid off. It's worth $250,000. Here's a secret. Social security is the greatest thing ever invented because it is an inflation protected annuity. Think about this. You got a 7% raise last year on social security. It's a, it's inflation protected annuity. How do I come up with $500,000? The average paycheck uh, monthly is 1500. Uh, do that on a, on a monthly, uh, yearly times 25, meaning you're 65, you're going to live to 90. So 20,000 times 25 is a half a million. So now you got a million dollar portfolio. Look at this. 
And you say to yourself, oh, I can't have 75% of my wealth in stocks. I can't afford to do that. But you're not. You don't have it. If you have 75% in stocks, you have 75% of 250 a uh, thousand here, that's, you actually have 18% of your net wealth in stocks at 75%. So I try to tell people to look at risk in a different way. Thoughts on 2023. I'm happy to talk about market immediately now. I didn't want to get into this too much, but the big debate is what side of the hard or soft landing you're going to be on right now. Uh, you can worry about a recession all you want. Nobody actually knows what a recession is, but I can tell you right now, the consumer is still pretty strong. And the job market is still pretty strong, pretty strong. We see signs of weakening, but not signs of anything crashing. Housing's already dropping dramatically. Prices are coming down. Forward-looking indicators are coming down. There's a lot of lagging indicators out there, but forward-looking indicators are looking good. Good prices are, are already showing signs of peaking, and wage growth is still strong. I personally don't find wage growth horrifying, but obviously it's an issue for the inflation front. The Fed has a problem. They have lousy instruments. They only have the ability to raise short-term interest rates, essentially. That is a very blunt instrument for a big US economy, and they always overshoot. It's just the way the system is set up. There is no fine-tuning mechanism for the US economy. It doesn't exist here. China is a major problem. It's an $18 trillion economy. You know, U.S. is a 23 trillion. They were heading to pass us. They're, they're probably not because they're going to start contracting because their population is now starting to decline. But the most important thing I see, positive real interest rates. My God, it's 4% on a two-year? 4% on a... My mother's sitting over here. She called me. She, oh, I said, Robert, I went to the bank. And the CDs, you're getting a real interest rate. When's the last time my mother called and said, CDs are looking good, Robert? Well, that's, you know, that's, pay attention. That's a sign. Your mother calls you, the CDs are looking good. That's a sign. It's, and the stock market has competition now. You, I don't want to get into, uh, you, you know, comp how the stock market's valued against the bond market, but 4% return on a two-year, and you're not sure how the stock market's doing? That's pretty attractive. A lot of people are going to keep money in the bond market this year that might have put it in the stock market. And that's good news. That's good news for savers. It's a more normal economy. Please, 0.3% for a 10-year. Who's going to give the government money for 0.3% for 10 years? It's ridiculous. I think it's tremendous. To close out here, precepts to live by. The kids say, what would you advise people getting older as they, as they get older? And I said, my advice is don't get old. It's, it's really annoying here. And you're going to live a lot longer than you think. You People make tremendous mistakes about this all the time. You, you think that you're going to pass away when you're 75. You're not. If you make it to 65, number one, your average age immediately is 83. So it's, the trick is just getting past like 65. You remember that old George Burns line? If you make it to 100, you got it made. Because once you get to 100, almost nobody dies after that. And it's, it's true because people just live longer and the technology is astonishing. My father, God bless him, passed away a couple of years ago. He was 90. He was held together with bailing wire for decades. A little, I mean, it was unbelievable how well he did because the technology just kept getting better and better and better. And it's going to get better. You people, I I'm 67. I used to plan on 85. All of the actuarials kept saying, Bob, 90 minimum, work at 95. You should be at 95 right now. And you people should plan on that as well. Understand your biases. I have, I had a whole new appreciation uh, in the last 20 years of what the stupid things I've done. And there's a chapter in the book explains my whole investing history, my relationship with Jack Welch at GE, the stupid investing mistakes I made. And at the end, if you're really interested, I tell you what I own. Most people never do that. I list what I own and I'll show you and I show you why I own them. Avoid group think. Don't keep thinking like everybody else. Try to be a little bit weird and be a little bit of an outlier. Group think is a major bias problem that people have. And finally, support innovation, support financial innovation. Don't think that because it was this way, it always has to be that way. The human brain doesn't change, but financial innovation, innovation in general 
really makes a tremendous difference. Thank you very much, everybody. And I'm going to take some questions right now, John. Bob, thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. I think we have time for just a few questions. So uh, do we have questions? Maybe two questions. Yes, right here. Cryptocurrency. Oh, brother. Wait, wait. Let me do that. Let me do that. Is crypto, the bar open? Here's the question. Crypto, bar's open. Cryptocurrency? Cryptocurrency? Okay. Uh, in uh, two minutes, okay? First of all, here's financial innovation, okay? Blockchain is potentially one of the most disruptive financial innovations of the last 50 years. Blockchain enables essentially means of verifications of financial transactions. So what you want to do in a financial system is reduce friction. You want to enable people to do things. I want to be able to send $1,000 to my friend in London. But if I do that right now, JP Morgan, there's six banks that control all the overseas traffic. JP Morgan takes a 3% fee. I don't want to pay JP Morgan 3%. That's crazy. There are better ways to send money. Blockchain is one of them. There are better ways to do real estate transactions. Try to do a real estate transaction. You know what it costs to do a real estate transaction? Try getting confirmation on the title insurance. That's one of the greatest scams ever invented. I want to be a guy who owns title insurance company when I come back. Another is clearance in the stock market. Clearance, you know what that is? It means you buy 100 shares of IBM. How do I know you got it? I guarantee you I'm a clearance company. I guarantee the guy you bought it from delivers it to your bank account, your brokerage account. And by the way, you get charged for that. I want to own that too. That's a great thing. I don't care what you people do. Whatever you do, you pay me. Every time you do anything, I'm the gatekeeper. And blockchain enables you to reduce the financial friction in that. So I'm a big backer of that technology. Here's the problem. There are things running off the blockchain, one of which is called cryptocurrencies. This is where you bring in Bitcoin. Okay, what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is a, is a cryptocurrency that is running off of the blockchain. What is the value of Bitcoin? There is no value of Bitcoin. They try to tell you there is. There is a theoretical crypto anarchist idea around the people who created Bitcoin because they don't like fiat currencies. Fiat currencies are currencies that are run by global uh, country, co companies around the world, countries around the world. Uh, we went off the gold standard, thank God, decades ago. Uh, and so there is nothing that ties the value of these currencies to anything other than what the companies, what the countries are basically saying they're worth. So countries can print money at will. People who created Bitcoin don't like that. They think that countries devalue their currencies, and some do. So they created Bitcoin, and this, this uh, cryptocurrency trades. So here's the simple problem. You might say, oh, well, this is going to a way of, you know, having some stable currency that we trade uh, for people who are overseas and it'll save us from countries seizing people's monies and things like that. This is a lot of nonsense. Uh, what Bitcoin is largely used for is criminal activity. And let's just admit that. I mean, are we all stupid? Do you not see what's going on? It's that gigantic criminal gangs control most of this money and we are facilitating criminal activity on a massive scale. Now that doesn't mean there's not a use case for this. On this idea about uh, this, this concerns about fiat currency, it is true that there is inflation out there and it is true that inflation has increased since the United States went off the gold standards, its countries did in general. However, the US dollar is backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. Bitcoin is backed by nothing, nothing. I'm sorry, full faith and credit of US government, bunch of nothing. Full faith and credit. I think I'll take the full faith and credit of the US government. And by the way, I do have concerns about printing too much money. We do have the, I'm not trying to be an apologist, but so you get my point. Support financial innovation. Blockchain has tremendous potential. I'm a bull on blockchain. Bitcoin, people say, what do you think of Bitcoin at 16,000? I have no opinion. Bitcoin has no intrinsic value at all. None. I collect rock posters. One of the things I do is rock posters. I, I know it's a stupid hobby. It's like, you know, the doors and Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, and I hang on my wall and it's great fun. And it's sort of part of the, my hippie stoner past. And I love it. 
But what's a rock poster? What's a Jimi Hendrix poster work, worth? It's not worth anything. It's only worth what somebody will pay me for it because it has no intrinsic value. It doesn't pay a dividend. It doesn't throw off some future stream of earnings like a stock does. It just sits on a wall. It's a collectible. And Bitcoin is a collectible too, essentially. Okay. So I hope I made myself clear on that. Okay. Support innovation, Bitcoin. Eh, Support blockchain. Ladies and gentlemen, we, we have unfortunately run out of time, but if you want to hear more- I will be hiding Bob, in the bar in the back. He'll be at the bar. And better yet, if you want some answers, buy the book. And if you're a BLF member and you haven't picked up your book, it's in the back of the room. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bob- Pisani, Thank you, Bob, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, remember Lincoln Day, is February 10th this year, and it will sell out. So go online and get your reservations for Lincoln Day. Have a great evening. Thank you. And again, thank you, Bob Pisani.